On today's episode of the CLS Experience, we have a very exclusive treat. She's a licensed clinical psychologist, a beacon of knowledge and insight, and a shining light on the complexities of human behavior, big facts. As the founder and CEO of Luna Education Training and Consulting, she has dedicated her career to understanding and educating others about the complexities of the human mind. Her focus on narcissism and high conflict personalities has made her a sought after expert in understanding the impact of these traits on relationships, mental health, and societal norms. No big deal. She's the author of the groundbreaking books such as Should I Stay or Should I Go? And Don't You Know Who I Am? And her YouTube channel, where she delves into the nuances of narcissism, has garnered millions of views, making her a digital sensation in the realm of psychology. She's also the host of the eye-opening podcast, Navigating Narcissism, where she explores the impact of narcissism on relationships. And she's a visionary and trailblazer in the realm of psychological understanding. She's just a juggernaut in all facets of life and a terrific human being. Please welcome the insightful, transformative, and charismatic, the multifaceted and abundant Dr. Romani. How you doing, Doc? I'm good. Yeah. yeah. So I, first of all, that's a, probably the best introduction I've ever got. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. I've never been called a juggernaut. So I'm going to file my <laughs> way under in the Dr. Romani Hall of Fame. So thank you. Oh, I'm pumped. Good. So, so I did good by you with that. I always take great pleasure in those. As I like to thank say, you. it's your story, you wrote it. I just said it with a little bit of extra enthusiasm. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. We're going to have so much fun today. Uh, the audience is for a real treat. We're about 6 million now. For our audience community, in case you guys weren't familiar, my best suggestion is to do a deep dive, play catch up, check out all her unbelievable content, her books, everything. What I think is most valuable today is we just have an unbelievable conversation. Before we dive in, we're going to get a little weird. You ready for me? I'm ready. When you wake up every day, for you personally, what are some non-negotiables for you? Feed the cat, make sure the hummingbird feeders are topped up, have some green tea. Mm. Um and turn off the house alarm. I guess those are my non-negotiables. Fair enough. That, everything else is open to, but those are the four things I do every morning. Fair enough. You said green tea. Does that mean you don't drink coffee? I don't drink coffee. No, I drink green tea. And it's a funny thing. I have been drinking green tea every day. I have not missed a day since 2008. When I went to Japan, I climbed Mount Fuji, had an extraordinary experience. And green tea was so built in there. I read all about the benefits of it. I'm not like a super health person. I'm really not. <laughs> and so then I thought, you know what? This is this is a light lift. I could, And I don't like green tea. So for how you do the math on that, how it was at 15 years at... Uh, 365 days a year, that's thousands of cups of green tea that I really didn't want to drink. But I have to tell you, it's such a, um, it's so soothing to have that one thing, no matter where I am on the planet, I carry the bags, tea bags with me, but I actually don't like it. It's not a thing for me. Coffee doesn't agree with me. So yeah. That's so interesting. That's cool. Mm -hmm. and, and you very casually said you, you climbed Mount Fuji. No big deal. I did. I did. I climbed Mount Fuji. I've actually used to be like in amazing shape. I climbed Mount Fuji. I climbed Half Dome. Like I was, I was doing it. And I'm oh. so glad I did. I climbed, you could only climb Mount Fuji for a very narrow window each year, like six weeks a year. And you go up, you see the sunrise. So I climbed it all night and saw the sunrise. And it was really a remarkable experience and um and so i'm um, yeah so that that trip was it was amazing for me but i'm a volcano nut like so it was very cool to be on the top it's of really volcano. interesting yeah. So yeah. i'm a marathon guy i just ran oh you are marathon. yeah two weeks ago less than two weeks ago and i only started running a few years back but for me oh. the running the marathons like yes I, I love to run but it's when i do my best connecting and, and the marathons for me it's all about the transformation I imagine it's something with you too, because you got to be a little nuts to climb these things. What is it for you about those, those big feats? At those times, like I don't do it. I don't do it anymore for a variety of reasons, but I, um, at the time it was a, um, it was, I, I loved being outside. It was, I never identified with being someone who was physically strong and um, like I was never an athlete, none of those things. And so it took me into a different world. I've always been fascinated by climbing and climbers. And I can't give you a good answer, but a good friend who is actually, he's, he's a, he's a really, really like high level climber. And the way I talked to him, he's like, I always have to remind myself, you're not a climber for how detailed your questions are. I don't actually understand. I mean, I'm a Capricorn, so maybe I'm a goat, I'm a climber, but not really. <laughs> so I re but for whatever reason, for a little window of time there, I really enjoyed 
I enjoyed doing it. Like I said, I don't do it anymore, but um, I'm so glad I did. It was it was a really interesting chapter of my life, and um, I'll never understand the fascination, but it's an endless, endless fascination. Yeah. And those things, it wasn't just about that climb, right? You take those with you forever. Like always, you, you always. Can transfer yeah. that into other mm -hmm. life experiences, obstacles, challenges, big yep. audacious goals, anything. I mean, you did that. What can you mm -hmm. not do, right? Just good for your mindset. Yeah. I totally agree with that because I never, I even now look now and say, how did I do that? You know? So I have to remind myself that I did do things that were beyond the pale and I, that I was able to do them at the time. And, and so, and then there's different things I do now that I never thought I'd be able to do then. So it is always about setting a new, um, a new summit, I guess, as it were, because that's really what a mountain is. It's a mountain's a process. There's a lot of planning and execution. So I think I like the, um, I like the whole, whole of it. Like I write books, right? So there's a lot of planning and execution and research. I'm a researcher, all those things. I think they're all the same process. So yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting because, and then I want to dive all into your book. We just launched our first book too, The Reinvention Formula. I see that. Congratulations. Thank you. We we hit Wall Street Journal bestseller USA today. Good for cool. you. But uh, as it turns out, um, looking back now, writing the book is kind of the easy part compared to spreading the message and getting yeah. out there and the TV appearances and the show. Thanks. It's a full-time job in yeah, itself. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and you wrote in quite, you've written quite a few. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's my world. fourth book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. And, and there's a pretty cool book right behind you right now that says it's not you, which is yes. dropping in February and this yes, episode will drop around then. I, I can't wait to dive into this. Why this book and, and why right now? Okay, so this why this book is a great question. Everybody's talking about narcissism. It's it's the word of our time. Everybody cares about it. Narcissism, gaslighting, all of it. I've already written two books that really delve deeply into what it is. But we're so obsessed with the what is it? Why are they doing the things they're doing that we're missing the really important part of the equation, which is what do I do? to heal once I've been through one of these relationships, which has done a real number on me. And that's what we're not talking about as much. And I have to say, while some people obviously have delved into this territory, the piece I've always struggled with is we make the assumption that, well, the easy path is if someone's treating you that badly, get out. That is not an option that is available to most people. A lot of people have to stay in long-term committed relationships because they have minor children, because they, for financial reasons, for health reasons, for fe reasons of fear, for culture, religion, they, if this is a narcissistic parent, they may feel like, I don't think I can walk away from my parents. I mean, they're, they're, they've hurt me in so many ways, but I don't feel like I can cut them off or a sibling. People are in jobs or in careers. They feel as though, listen, I've worked so hard to get to this point to have to leave. This means I am now hurting myself, but being in this job is really taking a toll on me. So not everyone has that option. And when the standard advice has been, well, get out, it's bad you've now left this huge group of people who also are not being given guidance. Like, what do you do? And it's not as simple as this is a jerk, then leave. These relationships really, really, like I said, do a number on people. People doubt themselves. They blame themselves. That's why it's called, it's not you, right? They blame themselves, doubt themselves. They become anxious. They feel helpless, hopeless, powerless. They feel stuck. They feel guilty if they leave. They feel foolish if they stay. All of that confuses a person and getting a person back to themselves after they've been through one of these relationships is a very, very difficult thing to do. That's what this book is about. For once, it's about the people who were harmed by the narcissistic people rather than a book about the narcissistic people themselves. I think that's so beautiful and so important. And look, you know a lot more about this stuff than I do, but it makes sense that you would mention that most people don't talk about this aspect of it. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No, they don't. And, you know, and part of the reason they don't talk about this aspect of it is because it kind of feels overwhelming, right? People will say, because what this, what my work has done, and this book does it in particular is, I hate to say it, but it takes away that kind of that hope people have had, like, they're going to change. All right, I'm saying I'm taking that one away. All right, they're not going to change. You are still going to heal. But what choices are you going to make? if you know that this person is not going to change. And then, the, you know, people say, oh, wait a minute, I didn't know that was the case. So you're not going to roll up to a holiday dinner thinking that this year is going to be different. You're not going to tell the narcissistic person, 
a hard time you're going through thinking that this time they're going to empathize. You're not going to work really hard for the narcissistic boss thinking this time they're going to advance me. This is not going to change. So you've really got to change your ground game. You've really got to change how you approach this. But again, there's two separate conversations here. One is how do you approach these relationships? But the other is how do you heal after in order to make this relationship work, you kind of had to give up on yourself. You had to become what they wanted you to be. And in doing that, if you've done it for decades or a lifetime, a lot of people will say, I don't even know who I am. Wow, that's unbelievable because you can't be authentic in a mm -mm, narcissistic mm -mm, relationship, mm -mm, correct? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. That, and I, lo I love that you said that. That's exactly right. You can't be authentic in a narcissistic relationship. And authenticity, quite frankly, is the key to mental health. If you look at humanistic theorists like Carl Rogers, who was the sort of the granddaddy of the humanistic psychology mo movement, that was it. That was the win. That was the prize. Be authentic. Be authentic means knowing who you are, and living in that. And so what I really want people to know, though, is that your authentic self is like this beautiful flag, but you don't get to unfurl it everywhere. The narcissistic person doesn't get to see your authentic self. It's not good for you to have that sort of completely shut down. So it's really about being discerning and saying, I know who I am. I am going to choose the places where I can show up as that person. I'm going to learn where I can't and with whom I can't do that. But the big issue, Craig, is a lot of people never even get to figure out what that authenticity is. Who am I? What do I stand for? What am I about? What are my values? What matters to me? How do I like going through the world? Even simple things like how do I want to spend a Saturday night? So many people are shaped by influences outside of them. It's very, very difficult, especially your, your first journey into authenticity is in adulthood. If you were told as a kid, be someone different, don't be you. It's, it's it's tough. It's a heavy lift. And also, I imagine social media doesn't make things easier. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. So social media was sort of the death knell for authenticity. And I think that to, to participate in that world and be authentic, I think it's possible. But you are the challenge is, is that to be a truly authentic person, one would at the highest level, at the highest level, one would argue you kind of don't care what anyone thinks or says, right? If you think of the old, uh, the, the Lao Tzu quote is care what other people think and you will forever be their prisoner. Mm -hmm. But that's easier said than done, right? Yeah. We do care. We want approval. We care what other people think of us. And social media was really constructed as a place to take authentic people down, to take all people down really, but to take authentic people down. So even in that space, an authentic person can be discerning in however way, whatever way they can, or they might say, I just don't care what other people are doing or what they're about i have to do what 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 is congruent what is consistent with who i am but in social in the world of social media we have now we are now being fully validated for creating and living in a false self that i mean and so what happens when you live fully in your false self is that your real self gets forgotten or maybe not even fully discovered social media is a tricky landscape that's a whole nother mm -hmm. episode mm -hmm. itself mm -hmm. In regards to, so I, I love this topic because you're right. Narcissism is a very sexy topic these days. And a lot of people talk about what it feels like, what it looks like, what are the red flags, but we don't often talk about how do we heal. So mm -hmm. without giving too much away, because obviously everyone's going to grab the book and mm -hmm. so forth. What is one thing maybe that someone listening right now that's tangible that they can take that they can maybe begin to heal themselves mm -hmm. after that? Mm -hmm. So I'd say, I'm going to give sort of kind of a three-part process. The first part is radical acceptance. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that this, the, the people with these personalities really don't change. It's very resistant to change, which means your relationship with them is not going to change if you're waiting for them to change. And when people get to a place of radical acceptance, there's a lot of grief. Like I, you know, people thinking, I really have waited my whole life for my father to notice what I'm doing, or I've spent 15 years thinking that this relationship would finally turn around once this or that happened. So there's a lot of grief because you're kind of giving up on a dream, right? But then as you move forward from that and you really get like, okay, now I see this and I'm no longer investing my sense of self in pleasing this other person, then you get to this place of, like I said, discernment. When we stop to think how much time people spend figuring out what special green juice should I take? What special workout should I do? What special this should I do? hours and hours and the this and the that I'm only going to go to the special grocery store where they get like virginal goat milk or whatever. I'm like, you're putting that much time 
into figuring out what to put in your body and yet you are spending endless hours with toxic people, you'd be better off smoking two packs of cigarettes then. You know what I'm saying? People are so careful in these other ways. But then when it comes to the effect of spending time with somebody who invalidates you, people like don't even think about it, right? Literally, they're, they're doing the equivalent of grabbing a bunch of cigarettes and eating a bunch of junk food. And so I really believe healing in, in many ways is that you start giving yourself permission to say, this isn't this interaction is not going to be good for me. You may not be able to avoid the person, but you're not going to get into it with them. You're not going to engage. You're not going to take the bait. When you have an option, you might go into a place. I'm, I'm sure, Craig, you've had this happen. Maybe you had a work opportunity or something like that, or an opportunity to collaborate with someone. And you met the person and they had all kinds of like hype and they had all kinds of opportunity, but something didn't feel right here in your body. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. But yet they had all the they had all the fundamentals. You're like, gosh, if I work with this person, they have all these connections, they have all this, they have all that, but mm, this doesn't feel good. How many of us said, you know what, this I, I've just got to go with this. There's there's too many opportunities here. And afterwards say, damn, my gut told me two years ago to not do this. And now yeah. I'm on the short end of this, right? That feeling you know, never right? really lets you down. Mm -mm. It doesn't let you down. And I think that what what is what is challenging is that I think all of us are probably better at detecting this than we think, but we often will talk ourselves out of it or we'll say, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to go to that party. There's three people there where I spent time with them. I don't feel good good afterwards. Give yourself permission to say no to the party or show up early or leave early or go and or set up a time when you, you love, you might love the host and say, listen, let's have lunch next week. I'd love to see you. We can choose these opportunities. And part of healing is when we say, you know what? I made a choice that was healthier for me. And that, or, that sort of builds up this inner core within ourselves. Like I was worth that. I'm going to be worth it again, but it's also being attuned to your body. And when you are feeling those feelings, whatever they may be overwhelmed, that you want to, that you're, you're angry and you were like, I can't believe this is happening. I want to get into it with them really ground into yourself, you know, sort of the hand on the heart, touch that pulse, your body, just tell your body I'm here and I can, you can feel my sympathetic nervous system wanting to fight the good fight as it were. But you're reacting to something that is harmful. When someone invalidates you, it's harmful. So you can connect with your body and say, I, I got this. I can do this. I don't have to get into the mud with this person. And above all else, I do not need to prove myself to this person or give in to them to appease them. Yeah, this is so good. So crazy in so many ways, in the best way. You mentioned something before, and I thought it was so beautiful. You have to accept it, right? And like when I reinvented myself at the Wall Street to what I'm doing now in the pandemic, I had this big spiritual awakening where I did not like where I was and I hoped I'd been at 35 years young, but for the first time ever, I accepted it. Doesn't mean I approved of it, but now right, that I right. accepted exactly. it, I can now mm -hmm. take uh, inspired action on mm -hmm. creating a new life and so forth and doing a lot of good in the world. And so I think acceptance is huge. And again, you don't have to approve it, but you do have mm -mm. to accept it because then you can make some changes. I love that you said that. You made a really important distinction here between accepting and approving, right? Because people say, well, does radically accepting something, meaning I'm signing off on it? I'm like, absolutely not. It's that you're seeing it for what it is. Because when we don't think, when we don't push ourselves to see things for what they are, we continue to live in an illusion, right? And when we live in an illusion, it is not healthy. And so it's the, it's, it's tense, right? We don't want to see it. You know, if you think of the old story of the fox and the grapes, right? The fox couldn't reach the grapes. So he told himself those grapes were sour. So he could live with the fact that he couldn't reach the grapes. It would have really sucked for the fox if someone said, yo, bro, these are the most delicious grapes in the world. Shame you can't have them. <laughs> oh, man, the fox would have been really bummed out. And I think in some ways, when we put too bright a light, on these toxic narcissistic relationships we have, it creates a lot of tension in us because it's really kind of a call to action that we got to do something. Maybe it's leave, but maybe it's also like, this is, this is not healthy. Like I'm, I'm sad because this is what my family of origin is, or this is the workplace situation is, or this is the business partner I have. And it becomes like, it really becomes a problem to be solved. And if we can sort of stay in the illusion, then we can kind of keep the status quo, not have to take action, not have to take the fight. But then we keep digging ourselves deeper and deeper into an unhealthy situation. It's not about acceptance is not approval. Acceptance is I see this clearly, and this is not okay. Yeah.
So good. I wonder what the you probably maybe you know the percentage of narcissists like in relationships that people don't even know that they're in one and they start blaming themselves, but they're in a relationship with the narcissist. Yeah, I think that, you know, again, this is, I, I just did a lecture on this yesterday. What we know is about, you know, there's a thing called narcissistic personality disorder. That's a different animal because most people who are narcissistic will not get into therapy and will not get formally diagnosed. But when we look at that research, which is very, done in a very structured way, we see rates of one to 6%. We can hazard a guess though, that when we look at narci uh, narcissism, the personality style, where there's enough of it, where it makes a difference. Listen, there's some people out there that are a little narcissistic, but it's such a little thing that you barely even notice it. But when it's enough narcissism to be causing trouble, I'm I'm spitballing this number, but it fits. And a lot of people are like, you know, this seems about right. It's about 20%. It's one in five. Crazy. And so it's not that uncommon. And I would actually say in major metropolitan areas like LA, like New York, it's going to be more because it's more competitive. It's more hard driven in those kinds. Is there certain industries you're going to see more narcissism, finance, media, politics, probably 40, 50% there, right? In, in a in an elementary school, the number of narcissistic teachers are going to be small. By nature, those are going to be agreeable people. But by and large, in the population, if we were to spitball it, probably about one in five, 20%. What's really interesting is that when you're in a relationship with a narcissist in any type of relationship, you almost feel weak because they have the ability to like trigger you mm -hmm. or manipulate you and so forth. But the truth of the matter is, is they're really, and maybe they don't do it on purpose, maybe whatever the case may be, but they're really skilled at what they do. And, and we should give ourselves a little grace, right? We shouldn't feel weak. Okay. So there, there's, again, you're, you're, you're so smart, Craig, by the way, I <laughs> question some of the best questions I've ever been asked. So thank you. For the, um, I'm loving this. Good. You know, so it's the, you know, first of all, you know, to your point about they're, they're so skilled and so smart. So let's start, start even more basic than that. I, you know, the stuff that makes up narcissism, not being empathic and being entitled and being grandiose and being arrogant and selfish and all that stuff, that's all unpleasant stuff. But what we've got to remember is that the narcissistic person is also really charming. Let me take a drink of water before. I no make problem. Yeah. 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 That's how you know there's about to be a good nugget. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> there we go. We also know, though, that the narcissistic person is really charming and charismatic, confident. They're often very successful. They're often quite attractive because they take really good care of themselves. So when a narcissistic person's coming at us in an adult relationship and they're charming, charismatic, successful, and attractive, it's pretty rare that a person will say, oh, boy, that that's trouble coming here, right? Well, it's like, well, that's, that person's really got it together. So most of us are naturally drawn to these folks. But you raise a really interesting other point, which is that they're actually quite emotionally intelligent in some ways and that they're able to read other people really well. So it's why they're all, all quite often really good at closing a sale. They are very good salespeople. So their, their capacity to sort of read a situation because they're doing it in a self-serving way, right? They're looking at the other person almost as a target. What do I need from this person? What can I get from this person? So they're studying them in that way. And not in the way of like, hey, I just want to get to know you. So I'm not, I'm not, if I meet someone, I'm not looking at how I can take advantage of them. I might just be curious about them, right? As though they're, I'm learning something about someone. That's the shrink in me. But for a narcissistic person, they're constantly data mining. They're like, what can I get from this person? What can this person do for me? But as a result, though, because they are so good at reading a room, if you will, they can figure out those tactical experiences. They're not good or... I should, let me I, I take that back. They can also read people's feelings, but they just don't care. So because they're callous and they're sort of indifferent, they're not going to stop and talk to someone who's sad if that's not going to benefit them. But it really does make it challenging because in a way they can sort of outplay people if you don't know what you're dealing with. Because you might think you're dealing with this really socially skilled, charismatic person who's got it all together and seems to have all this, seems to be saying all the right things that it's really hard to wriggle out of that situation unless you know what you're dealing with. Yeah, it's just a crazy experience because now that I'm a lot more informed about some of the stuff, it's like you look back on your life and you realize, and look, none of us are perfect, we're all flawed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but you mm -hmm. realize, yeah, th those are probably some narcissistic relationships that I was in.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we've all been in them because, again, we're sold the bill of goods that these are the people you want to be in relationships with. Mm -hmm. Nobody out there is saying, hey, find a person who's a little bit socially awkward and a bit bumbling and doesn't dress well and isn't super attractive, but right. is super sweet and nice and compassionate and great and kindly and loving and sees all this wonderful stuff in you. Nobody's selling anyone that bill of goods. I'd love to see that Disney movie. Yeah, same. I, I saw you say so, and I, I was checking out your content, which I highly suggest everybody do immediately follow this conversation. And I saw you write that the personal development gurus with some of the biggest followers can actually tend to be the most dangerous and damaging. And I thought that was really interesting. Well, so spiritual spaces, um, self-development spaces, these can actually be quite dangerous because many times the people who run these spaces are very charismatic they make big big promises and obviously people who are going into self-development spaces are trying to transform and so what you'll see is that these these systems are often run as as gaslighted pyramid schemes right like oh i get it i guess i, I see what you don't want to go to the next level you know you're not ready to grow you're not everyone ready to be their best self and i can see that with you like i get it and i understand it's an investment but you know listen people some people buy other stuff with their money right you want to go buy groceries you want to go buy that stuff sure that'll get you to the short term but i can understand why you don't want to buy you don't want to go to the next level but you've come pretty far now most people will be like I, I want to grow. And so all of a sudden, you, you, like you said, they start handing over money. They start recruiting other people into a system. But this leader is basically what will often say if a person isn't getting better. This is common in, in the culty self-development guru leader types who will say things like, well, if you're not improving, it's not my fault. It's not what I'm telling you. It's got to be you. And I, my book is telling you it's not you. It's right. this manipulative impresario who's selling this bill of goods and saying, you know, listen, if you do this and this and give me all this money, then, you know, everything will be healed. And the, the promises people make in these development spaces are big. Listen, I spent like a thousand years in graduate school and clinical training and all of that, all of that to learn, like, there's no quick fixes here. We have histories. We have backstories. We have experiences we've been through. We have distorted cognitions. It takes a minute to get in there, lift the hood and muck around with the apparatus in a person so that they feel safe within themselves, so that they feel like they can trust themselves, that they feel like they can show up as themselves. And then we have to account for the conditions that car is going to be driven under, which is culture and society and all of that. So there's no quick, there's no quick fixes. There's no $2,000 coaching program that's going to make someone better. This takes a minute. And I think that when people are told, well, I guess if you're not getting better, it's all your fault. That to me, that to me is straight up likely sort of some sort of gaslighting guru. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And it's like, a, you know, it's a, it's an easy topic to, to really mm -hmm. grab someone because they like, oh, mm -hmm. you don't want to improve. So I totally get that. Mm -hmm. Screw the listeners to be aware of. I'm curious in regards to like, let's just say there, there's a narcissist parent and they have some kids and the kids are young. I mean, that might be all they know from growing up in that household. What are some of the, the effects that are on kids that grow up with a narcissistic mm -hmm. parent or something like that? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. And it's probably one of the most insidious effects we see. A narcissistic parent is a selfish parent, but it goes beyond just mere selfishness. A narcissistic parent basically shames the child for needing or wanting anything, almost leaving the child feeling selfish that they're needing from the parent, interrupting the parent. If the child doesn't show up exactly the way the parent wants. So it's almost like the child becomes an accessory for the parent. If the child has interest that the parent wants or does things the way the parent wants or looks the way the parent wants, they're going to have a smoother path. But people who have narcissistic parents will have been chronically criticized and told you're not doing good enough and being compared to other people. Um, there's often a sense of the only way to be loved in these families is to do everything that the parent wants. So you have to earn the love. It's very transactional. It's very conditional. And what that does to a child is they start to believe, especially as they come into adolescence and adulthood, that their needs and wants are selfish, that they are shameful for wanting and needing things, that in order for a relationship to work, that they have to give in to be able to have a, a safe attachment to someone. You have to do what the other person wants. You can see where that's going to go really quickly. So having a narcissistic person really fills a person with anxiety, self-doubt, 
self-blame. The child may think, oh, mommy or daddy's in a bad mood. It's got to be my fault. What did I do? And you can see how that can create a lifetime of the child, if they're an adult, blaming themselves for another person's bad day. Yeah, it's good to highlight right now. It's tough. Yeah, but but it's good to, for us to be educated on this. So, oh, so, it's absolutely so, crucial yeah. because it's not, I think some people say, oh, I don't feel comfortable just writing off my parent as narcissistic. And some people say, listen, I know my own parent had their own bad journey, right? They had abusive parents or they had a difficult immigration process or they had a difficult, you know, they grew up with not enough money or resource. That's great to have that empathy, but none of that is ever an excuse for somebody treating you poorly. You can say, my parents did a number on me while I understand their behavior. It's about giving yourself permission to also say what they did wasn't okay. And what they did to me left me wounds that have lasted and they're not going to change. So I really have to be aware and discerning of how I continue to interact with them. So I think that a lot of people say, well, they've been through a lot, so I'm going to give them a free pass. That's just signing you up for more and more and more of the same. We can be compassionate. We can be aware of what someone's backstory is and also disengage. I don't know that it's ever healthy for anyone to say, well, they've been through a lot, so I'm just going to put up with how badly they're treating me. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah, that's beautiful. And the word again comes to mind, acceptance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How you were brought up and so forth doesn't mean that you have to love it or have you know a Mm -hmm. giant pity party, but acceptance. Mm -hmm. And then so if it is a really, really close person to your life that you don't want to completely, you know, cut Mm -hmm. off entirely, Mm -hmm. how can you disengage, but maybe keep something going? and Mm -hmm. not get down not necessarily go down the rabbit hole again and harm yourself and your own mental health Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i think that i think that what you're describing is a lot of people in these relationships a lot of people say listen this is someone who yes they've they've treated me really badly a lot of the time i don't always feel like i can be my true self here they make me feel like i'm less than or any of that however This person is a close member of my family, or this is a person I'm co-parenting children with, or some, it's it's a person I've known for a long time. I'm not ready to fully walk away from this person for whatever your reasons are. And everyone's reasons for not wanting to walk away are valid. There's no judgment, no shaming there. It's the under, it's the having the realistic expectations. This relationship has limitations and there's nothing you can do to make them different. So before you roll up and see them and you know that they're going to do passive aggressive, silent treatment stuff, if you don't agree with everything they want, or if you don't say what they want, or you don't, you know, you don't, um, uh, or, or they're going to shoot down your interests, your ideas, any of that, you know, what's coming, Right. And as a result, you can prepare. I often call, there's a strategy I call preparing and releasing. I say, if you know you're going to be with a narcissistic person, again, a a, a birthday party, a wedding, a a work meeting, whatever it is, prepare. Mm -hmm. Don't just walk in cold. You wouldn't wouldn't not pack a suitcase for a trip, right? So you're like, okay, I know what I'm dealing with. Can't bring up this. Don't want to deal with this. Got to remember not to take the bait with them. They are going to compare me to my sister. Okay, I'm aware all that's going to happen and breathe. And I always tell people, if you have the time and you have a private space about for three to five minutes before you go in, breathe, just pull the car over to the side of the road, you know, sit in the lobby of the building, whatever it is, and, and get that centeredness and then go in. And invariably, they're going to do all the things you expected. In a way, you might even sort of gently smile to yourself. You're like, okay, game on. Here we go. And you're saying, okay, I read, I, I was right. And I can be discerning and I don't have to engage. In fact, the technique I give to a lot of people, if they have to keep interacting with narcissistic folks is something I call don't go deep. And deep stands for don't defend, don't engage, don't explain, and don't personalize. So when they start coming at you with something you didn't do, don't defend yourself. You didn't do it. Why are you defending yourself? So if they're going on and on say, mm-hmm, it doesn't mean you agree with them. Like, okay, yeah, you know, I can see that we're having different experiences here, yeah. but don't defend, experience. don't engage, like don't get into the mud with them. When they try to bait you, draw you into a ridiculous political argument or something else you don't want to have, say, okay, yeah, no, nah, I'm good. Like I, I, I got you, I hear you. And you know, and if you can't even de- gently step away to the bathroom or something, do that. Don't explain because they're not really listening to you in a way it's a tactic for them. They're trying to get you in a corner. So the more you try to explain, you're like, no, 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 let me just explain my point of view. They're going to overwhelm. There's, there's, it's never going to get you to a healthy landing place and don't personalize. And what I mean by that, it feels personal because you're being attacked, but they do this to anyone. It's just the personality. Narcissistic people have to 
have the power, they have to control, and they have to dominate. That's how relationships are set up for them. Yeah. That's the purpose it serves for them. That's not your ground game. You're not trying to control, dominate, and power. So you're both playing very different games in this relationship. So don't get into a power struggle with them. And yeah. a lot of it is just let it go. And then, though, on the back end, after the encounter is done and you've left your home, you're in the car, whatever, release, breathe a little. You're going to be tired if you take a nap, take a shower, have a workout, watch a show that makes you laugh, read something you like, whatever it is, take your dog for a walk, whatever it is, something that recenters you. These spending time with these folks in a way, it's almost like it takes you off your center and you yes. have to recalibrate and get yourself back to center. And you have to build that into the time. You have to say, okay, I've had this day. And when I know any day, I, I call it my own personal toxic meter. If I've had an interaction that goes over that line, I make myself a promise by eight, nine o'clock, it's everything off. Phone goes on airplane mode. So literally no one can reach me. And I, I have a list of things that I love to do. And I do one of those things and I go to bed early. And it, it, it's and it's intentional. I know why I'm doing it. Yes, they're, they're dying to have a dance partner. Mm -hmm. and don't mm -hmm. engage. And then also- it's so relatable what you just said like after you leave like you start to like if you don't have that meter and you know how to recalibrate and get back to center mm -hmm. it can be totally thrown mm -hmm. off like upset mm -hmm. with yourself like how do i let my frequency get lowered but it, i got but i'm saying all this and i'm also recognizing it's hard because it's not just that they're always attacking you but there's a lot of manipulation you know a lot of people will say i feel guilty because they'll say well why aren't you staying longer or you know how come you're this or i did this for you why can't you stay why can't you do this for me so they really play on your on your trigger points on your empathy on your sense of guilt and your sense of duty so I'm not saying this is easy and in in many ways what people will say is in order to heal from this narcissistic relationship I, at times I had to be a person I wasn't comfortable being like people saying I had to become a person who was a bit more of a hard ass. I had to be a person who had to sort of set a harder line and people say that doesn't feel like me. It doesn't feel good. And they'd say every interaction with this person meant setting a thousand boundaries and it just becomes exhausting for yeah. folks for whom that doesn't come naturally. Yeah. I heard you say somewhere that there's a, a connection between narcissism and addiction. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. So, nar so narcissistic personality disorder and narcissistic personality addiction is the most common co-occurring mental health condition. Most common. And it makes sense because when we look at the psychology of an addict, it's very similar to the psychology of a narcissistic person, but for different reasons. Addiction's a disease, right? And so there's a brain that has changed because of, of um, the repetitive use of a psychoactive substance, whatever it may be. That's the that's the detox behavioral part, right? So a person can simply stop using, right? Stop using drugs, stop drinking, whatever, stop smoking, but really stop using, right? But then they're still behaving like an addict would. Lots of denial, lots of rationalization, lots of jealousy, jealousy and competitive, competitiveness and victimhood and all of that. That's sort of what we call the dry drunk, in fact. Mm -hmm. The dry drunk is very much a narcissist. And so the only way to fully heal from addiction is the to eliminate drunk? your own narcissism, the dry drunk. Yeah. Are you familiar with that concept? No, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So dry drunk is like a 12 step concept. And it's something that people who work in addiction talk about. And the dry drunk is a person who's no longer using, they're fully sober. They're not, they're not using drugs in any way, but they still have a lot of the personality characteristics of an addict. So people say, well, this person is every bit as difficult as they always were. The difference is they're sober. Right. And so in order to be, if you look at, again, and this is more of a 12 step modeling, but if you think of it in that kind of a 12 step model to be truly fully sober, you have to be humble and honest and transparent. Wow. And if you're not those things, you are not sober. Wow. That was a breakthrough because clearly as you're speaking, you know, I'm thinking about life and stuff and uh, it makes perfect sense what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I have to ask you, I was before we land the plane. This is, this is a pretty interesting topic. I imagine there's a story. What made you make this mm -hmm. a real body of work? You know, so interesting you say that there's a lot of different ways. I was a professor for many years, so I did research and my research actually there was we were having some some of the people in the research areas we were working in 
they were behaving in these narcissistic ways. I'm like, God, these, these patients are creating havoc in the clinics. And that started me on the research direction in my private practice. I was increasingly seeing patients who are talking about the same kinds of relationships with partners, with families. And I'm thinking, well, let me educate them on this personality style. Invariably, the person doing this to them was always had, had narcissistic qualities. But I think that the part that was getting me was there was, I was able to go, obviously I did the research and there was this really robust literature on what narcissism is and where it comes from and what it looks like and how to try to treat it and blah, blah, blah. But I'm like, how come nobody's talking about what this is doing to other people? Nobody was talking about it. And I said, okay, this is not okay. And that really, for me, became a catalyst. But I understand where you're going, which is, it was interestingly not until I was deep into doing this work that I actually really started connecting the dots. And I have actually had multiple in incredibly impactful, painful, narcissistic relationships in my life, in family members, in former partners, in friends, in business relationships. And all of those relationships blew my life up in significant ways and changed me in permanent ways. I don't think you come to the other side of this unchanged. And many of the changes are good. Many of the changes are not things I wished for for myself. And yeah. I'll always live with some of that grief on ways that I still remain inhibited and scared in the world and self-devaluing and very much like an imposter. I know where that comes from, but in some ways, knowing that allows me to engage in more self-compassion when that stuff comes up. Whereas back in the day, I just simply took those things as a truth. I am an imposter versus I feel like an imposter and I understand why that's a very different sentence. And so some of my healing is understanding how that affected me, but also it's almost like if you get, there's some, some people get injuries where they can start walking again, but maybe they're never going to run again, or they're never going to climb again. It's like that, like I can still walk, but I did lose something. And I, I have to say that that was definitely my lived experience. That was the most beautiful thing I ever heard. And, and thank oh, you for bless. keeping thank it you. so real and raw. And, and I think this is good because some things in life, like spoiler alert for the audience, right? you might not ever heal from. No, I agree. I agree. Right? Like bad dramas or, you know, events or the loss of someone or a relationship or whatever. That doesn't mean that we don't move on, but it's okay to acknowledge that we will never be quite the same. And I you like won't be the same. And I, yeah. And I think we overrate being the same, right? You yep. know, I was just talking with someone about this. One of the things I write about in the book is applying the model of the hero's journey to what happens to a person in a narcissistic relationship. And to me, one of the most compelling parts of the hero's journey, it's not, you know, that you start on a journey and you have the fights and you fight your demons and there's fellow travelers and there's challenges and you want to give up and all of that. It's that at the end of the journey, all people who go through that journey are forever changed. They're not the same person. And as a result, they sometimes go back to their old places. Think of all the people who might've gone back to their old hometown and say, wow, you know, I don't even feel in my body when I'm in this place, right? Like I've changed. And I think that we feel this sense of, well, shouldn't we always be who we are? You, that core of you is always who you were, but when you were trying to be what other people wanted and you slowly let that go and let, let that go fade away, you don't go back to the beginning. You are someone new. You're definitely stronger. I believe that healing is, again, healing doesn't take you back to the beginning. Healing doesn't mean you're back to baseline. And healing may mean that you do always psychologically sort of walk with a little bit of a limp. That's okay. I mean, that's okay. Like I said, you know, the people, people who can carry their scars beautifully, it's really, it's a lot, it's a lot more interesting then someone's face doesn't, that doesn't carry any of those 100%. lines. And we mm -hmm. call that life. We've been mm -hmm. through stuff. Yeah, it's life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Thank you for normalizing that. Mm -hmm. Nobody should feel shame or guilt mm -mm. about having gone through something. Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. Yeah. Do you talk about that in the book a little bit? So in, in, in that book, so in the book, what I do tell is, I think that a lot of people, and there's folks out there who have healing in six weeks, you'll heal from narcissistic abuse. I'm like, no, 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 that doesn't work that way for some people. I'll be frank with you. And some people in four or five weeks, especially if it's a shorter relationship and they get all the fundamentals, they're like, oh, okay, got it. Thank you. So great, great. And they're actually doing much better for some people where this is much more deeply felt. It's years and years and years. And what I tell people is you never, ever put a clock on healing. Any day you get up in the morning and you commit to try to doing that work of healing, to try to 
facing down some of your demons to having the difficult conversation if you have to, of saying no to something you know is going to be difficult, whatever heroic thing you did that day, clock that up in the win column. That was another step towards healing and that there is no clock on it, that there is no perfect way to do it. That you, And I think a lot of people feel pressure. They're like, oh, if I've healed, that means I'm going to go out and I'm going to write a novel or I'm going to save the world. No, 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 no. It means that you're actually getting up every morning and fighting the good fight. As far as I'm concerned, then you feel. Yeah, beautifully said. I couldn't agree more. This was so much fun. Thank um, you. Thank yeah, you so yeah. much. Yeah. But before we wrap up, we're going to do a, a quick, fun, rapid fire. Mm -hmm. Maybe one or two word answers. Sure. You ready for me? Yep. Let's have some fun. Okay. Favorite movie? Casablanca. Classic. Your last meal on earth would be? My, my mother's South Indian cooking. Your favorite guilty pleasure is? Reality TV. <laughs> Fair enough. Your favorite workout? Walking on the treadmill. Your favorite book, not including yours? <laughs> uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Good one. And last... no, I'm going to change that one. Let's go back to favorite book. Okay. Let's redo. I, I'm gonna have another. I have a better answer. Okay. You want to you want to ask a question again, or for your edit, or just no, kind of, no give me the other one. Oh, the Poisonwood Bible. Okay. Fair enough. And then, and then the other one would be like a close second. Very. They're they're in a dead heat. I'll give me one nonfiction, one fiction, and then we're good. Okay. Okay. And then the last one. This is gonna be very deep. You ready for me? Uh -huh. Your favorite musician. Ah, my favorite musician. <laughs> um, mm, that's that's a, always a tougher one, right? Um, I think I am going to have to go with someone who's just so otherworldly with their music. I'm gonna have to go with Miles Davis. Mm, very classic. All of the things that you said, very classic. I'm old. Everything when you're older is classic. You're not old. Other than the reality TV. <laughs> you're not old. You're classy. <laughs> There you go. I'm, I, I, vintage is how I prefer to think of myself. <laughs> this was so much fun. I think Thank I you. it is for our listeners. What's the best way for all of them to support mm, you? I, yeah. I imagine the book. Is there a specific place? Do you have any bonuses where they can grab it? Yep. So I'm telling everyone pre-order this book and we're having all kinds of pre-order incentives, but really having this book will, will be a game changer. And you you can go ahead, you can go to my website. You'll see all the stuff we have going on. So my website's drromany.com. We'll send you all that information. So we have, if you are going through a narcissistic relationship and you're working on your healing, we have a monthly healing program. If you're interested in doing a much deeper dive, we have a robust YouTube channel every day. We have new content coming out, Instagram, but above all else, above the social media, order the book because it's a one-stop shop of everything we've talked about. Buy it, mark it up, make it your own, turn it into your sort of personal guidebook to healing from your narcissistic toxic relationship or any relationship that left you feeling less than because really the message of that book, and I feel it strongly, is it's not you. I love that. Beautifully said. Uh, this was so much fun. You're beautiful. Thank you. Story. Yeah, heck yeah. Hang out for one sec. I want to connect with you after. Doc, I want you to know you the definition of authenticity, compassion, and deep wisdom. I could personally guarantee your best yet to come. Keep on spreading your wings and leaving your mark on this world. So much love and respect for you. Thank you so much for stopping by and dropping these priceless, juicy nuggets today. <laughs> I mean, I could talk to you all day. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was great. It was a really great interview. You're a wonderful interviewer. You were, I, I love I love how prepared you are. I love how curious you are. Your questions are just amazing. So, you know, whatever your process has been, you're able to obviously ask questions to a lot of people about a lot of different topics, and that's not an easy task. So thank you so much.